This video and the next few uh, videos will be covering integrals of different kinds of functions, how to find the integrals of different functions using complex analysis, and specifically the residue theorem. So in this video, this will be integrals of rational functions. So before we get into that, uh, let's go into a few things that's going to help us in uh, the integrals of rational functions. So we're going to talk about a few things about polynomials. So here's a polynomial of a complex function, z. So we have p of z, polynomial, is equal to a sub n z to the power of n plus a sub n minus 1 z to the power of n minus 1 plus so on, all the way to constant term a naught. So this constant term doesn't have a z in front of it because it's z to the power of 0. So now also note that a sub n is not equal to 0. And since this is a polynomial, we have to expect that one term, one coefficient at least, is not 0. So that the polynomial is not, you know, just equal to 0. So we have that polynomial. We're going to find three facts about it, and the third one will be the most important to us. So if p of alpha is equal to 0, which means that alpha is a 0 of p, then using the rules of algebra, which you might remember, you can factor out this alpha in a z minus alpha, and you're left with a new polynomial that has a lesser degree. Because this has a degree 1, this will have a degree n minus 1, so when you multiply them, they'll have a degree n, just as p does. Okay, so next thing is there exists at most n points at which p of alpha j is equal to 0. And all that's saying is that uh, alpha has at most n zeros. Um, and that's just another thing from algebra you may remember. Um, because if you have a quadratic equation, for example, you have x squared or x squared plus 1, that has at most two zeros because the power is 2. Okay, and same thing for all other polynomials. The third one is most important to us. So we want to find the limit as modulus z approaches infinity of modulus p of z over z to the power of n. Okay, how do we do that? Well, the first thing we'll do is take p of z, which is this uh, long statement right here, and divide it by z to the power of n. And when we divide that, we'll, when we take a sub n, z to the power of n, divided by z to the power of n, we're just left with a sub n. We divide this by uh, z to the power of n, we get just a z on the bottom, because exponents cancel out, and so on, until we get the constant term divided by z to the power of n. And again, we have the modulus of all of that. And now we want to find the limit as modulus z approaches infinity. So as modulus z approaches infinity, z is getting very, very large, which means that the denominator here is getting very, very large, and this is just a constant. So this is going to go to zero as z gets big. And same thing here, z is going to get even bigger. It's going to get very, very big. This is going to go to zero. This is the only constant term that's not affected by the rising z. So all that's left is just modulus of a sub n. And again, we said that a sub n is not equal to zero, which means that its modulus cannot be equal to zero. And since modulus is always a positive number, we have to have modulus a sub n is greater than zero. Okay, so with this information, we're going to say, let's pick a modulus z equals big R that's so big that we have the modulus of p of z over z to the power of n is less than 2 modulus a sub n, but greater than or equal to uh, 1 half modulus a sub n. Okay, and what does this mean? Well, what we found, we found that um, as with the limit as modulus z approaches infinity of this quantity right here, which is the same thing as this quantity right here, uh, it approaches a sub n. So if we just draw a little number line right here, let's say here is a sub n modulus right there. So here would be 2 a sub n modulus, and here would be 1 half a sub n modulus, okay? So since this limit, as z gets bigger and bigger and bigger, this quantity right here, which is again this quantity right here, is approaching this target value, then that means when z is big enough, then it's going to be in this range. Because let's just say that for some value of z, it's outside this range right here. And the next value of z, as z gets bigger and bigger, it's approaching that, right? So let's say next value of z, it's here. So now it's inside the range. And then the next value of z, it's here. So that means that at this value of z right here, we have entered the range. Or you can enter the range from this other direction uh, as well. But there's going to be some value of z that's you can pick it big enough so that it's going to be within this range from 1 half a sub n modulus to 2 times modulus a sub n. Okay? So once you pick that range, we have this right here. Uh, we're going to multiply all three of these right here by this denominator, and the denominator here is modulus z to the power of n, and we call it modulus z is r. So this is just equal to modulus z to the power of n, because we can take the exponent out, and this is just r to the power of n. Okay, so we're going to multiply everything by modulus z to the power of n, so this is just modulus p of z, this is 2 uh, modulus a sub n r to the n, and this is 1 half modulus a sub n r to the n. Okay, now this is going to be the most important for us as we do the uh, integral of rational functions. So let's get right into it. So what's the premise? The premise is that p and q are polynomials, which are real valued on the real axis. Which What's the real axis if we have the complex plane? The real axis is the horizontal axis. So that means if we put in uh, p or q of anything on this axis, we're going to get a real number, not an imaginary number. Um, also, the degree of q should be greater than or equal to the degree of p plus 2. We'll see why that's important in uh, just a sec.
So um, now we also have that Q of X is not equal to zero for all real X, which means if you take Q of anything on the real axis, it should never zero out. It should always be uh, something non-zero. Okay, so uh, now we want to find, so the integral we're interested in is integral from negative infinity to infinity of P of X over Q of X DX. Now let's notice one key thing. This is not a imaginary integral. This is real, right? Because we're just traveling from negative infinity all the way on this side. We're traveling all the way to positive infinity and we're taking the integral along the whole real axis. And what do we know about the real axis? Well, we know that they're real valued on the real axis, P and Q, which means we can never get an imaginary number for this integrand right here. We also know that Q of X is never equal to zero, which is good because that would cause problems. Um, so we're just adding up a bunch of real numbers. So we're getting a real integral. Yet the, the amazing thing is we're gonna use complex analysis and we're gonna have a bunch of I's floating around before they all cancel out. So let's see how this magic kind of works. So remember from the residue theorem, we talked about that curve gamma. Now that's going to be the challenge in all of these integral problems is finding a suitable gamma. So it turns out for integrals of rational functions, if you ever have something of this form, and we'll do an example at the end, if you ever have something of this form, you need to pick a, uh, a gamma that looks like this. It's going to be a semicircle. So let's say the starting point is going to be right here. This point right, uh, let me draw in black, this point right here. So that's the starting point. This curve is made by traveling first along the uh, real axis in the rightward direction, and then you go in a semicircle of radius r all the way back to your starting point. So again, you travel on the real axis from negative r to positive r, and then when you get here, you travel in a semicircle arc back to your negative r starting point, and this whole curve is called gamma sub r, okay? So this curve consisting of this uh, horizontal portion and the semicircle portion, okay? So now we're gonna say, assume Q of Z is not equal to zero for Z is on gamma sub R. And why can we assume that? Well, we know that uh, one part of gamma sub R is this horizontal portion, but we already established that Q is never zero on the horizontal portion, so we're good there. Now the other place it could be zero is on the semicircular arc. So let's say, for example, it is zero. Let's draw an X right here. Let's say Q of Z is zero there. Well, no problem, we just pick a new R. Because R is arbitrary, right? We didn't pick any fixed value for it. So you just make R bigger, you make it bigger, 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 um, until you have a clean circular arc where Q of Z is never zero on that arc, okay? And what else can we do? We can say on gamma sub R, when R is big, we can make this estimate. And this estimate is based on uh, this green underlined estimate we uh, made right here, okay? So we have the modulus of P of Z over Q of Z. So if we want to make this small, so the P of Z modulus is again, less than or equal to, so we uh, have here, it's P of Z modulus is less than or equal to two times A sub N modulus, times r to the power of n, which is exactly what I've written here. Now, since q of z modulus is a denominator, we want to try to go the opposite direction, because if we want this fraction right here to be as big as possible, we want to make the numerator as big as possible, but the denominator as small as possible. So we're going to pick the uh, lower bound on the q of z. So if this were q of z, this is a different polynomial, so we're going to say q of z is greater than or equal to 1 over 2 modulus b sub n, just because we want different uh, coefficients, r to the power of m. So again, we're going to do r to the power of m because uh, the that the m is going to represent the um, the degree of q of z, and n is going to represent the degree of p of z, and we'll see the relationship between them in a second. So now, just understand why I've written this uh, estimate right here because we want to make the numerator big and the denominator small to make this uh, this quantity right here bigger than or equal to our modulus of our fraction. Okay. So 2 over a half is 4, and then we can combine this modulus a sub n over modulus b sub m as modulus a sub n over b sub m. And then if we have r to the power of n over r to the power of m, that's going to be less than or equal to r to the power of negative 2. Let me explain that. So I've written uh, the last statement again right here. Why is that going to be less than or equal to uh, r to the negative 2? Well, we know that m is greater than or equal to n plus 2. Let's say m was equal to n plus 2. Okay, what would that do? So if m right here was equal to n plus 2, we would have r to the power of n over r to the power of n plus 2. And that would be r to the negative 2, which is as big as possible. Because if we had, uh, if m was bigger, let's say m was uh, n plus 3, right? If m was n plus 3, then we would have r to the power of negative 3, which is even uh, smaller. So the absolute biggest that r to the power of n over r to the power of m can be is r to the power of negative 2. If we have any other combination, if m is even bigger, then we're going to have something that's like r to the power of negative 4, negative 5, and that's going to be even smaller. So the uh, absolute biggest it can be, we know for sure that it's less than or equal to r to the power of negative 2. So that's the absolute biggest it can be.
Okay, so again, we have less than or equal to 4 times modulus a sub n over b sub m times r to the negative 2. And this 4 times modulus a sub n over b sub m, these are all constants, right? a sub n is a constant, b sub m is a constant, so uh, we just have to do 4 times this constant. It's just a new constant. We're going to call it c divided by r squared, which is right here. Okay, so now what we're going to do, we're going to use that estimation formula for integrals we did in the Green's theorem video, and uh, we're going to do it here. So we have, we're trying to estimate just the integral over this semicircle, okay? We're not worrying about this line just yet. So if we're estimating the integral over that semicircle, which is given right here, so it's the integral of p of z over q of z dz when z is equal to, when modulus z equals big R, and y is greater than or equal to zero, which means upper half plane. Um, this is less than or equal to the maximum value of the integrand, maximum value of modulus p of z over q of z uh, when z is on that circle times the length of that semicircular arc. So what's the maximum value of p of z over q of z modulus? Well, we found right here that it's c over r squared. So we have c over r squared, and the length of that semicircular arc is just 2 pi r divided by r, uh, divided by 2. So it's going to be pi r. So then this r squared and this r cancel. So we're just left with c pi over r. And c pi over r, let me just write it here, c pi over r, because c and pi are both constants, as r approaches infinity, this is going to go to zero, because the denominator will get very, very big. And what does graphically mean when we say r approaches infinity? That means the semicircle gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and as it goes to infinity, it becomes the entire upper half plane, because it's just encompassing everything out there. Okay? So, now we're going to finish this off. We're going to say that the integral of p of z over q of z as z uh, on the uh, modulus z equals r semicircular arc y is greater than zero. So it's the upper half semicircular arc plus the integral from negative r to r of p of z over q of z dz. So that is the line we're talking about. And even though it's in terms of z, really on this line everything is in terms of x. So the integral from negative r to r. So now we're doing that integral plus this integral, which is the entire uh, gamma sub r integral is equal to the integral from negative infinity to infinity of p of z over q of z dz as r approaches infinity. And why is that true? Because let's look at this integral. As r approaches infinity, we establish that that integral approaches zero, right? So this just goes away. So all we're left with is just this integral. And now we can substitute in infinities for these r's because r is going to infinity. So we're just left with this integral, which is the integral exactly that we wanted to evaluate from the beginning. But let's know one last thing. What is the entire integral equal to? And by entire integral, I mean what is the integral around this plus this, around the whole gamma sub r equal to? By the residue theorem, because this is a simple, closed, positively oriented, so on, curve, the integral around this whole gamma sub r is equal to the 2 pi i times the sum of the residues that lie inside here. So if we have an isolated singularity here, we have an isolated singularity here. If we take 2 pi i times the sum of the residues at those isolated singularities of f then we're going to get the value of the entire integral. And what's the value of the entire integral? Well, it's going to be this integral plus this integral. And we said this one goes away, goes to infinity, so we don't have to worry about that one. So that means the value of the whole integral is just this in, these, in this green underline, the integral from negative infinity to infinity, p of z over q of z dz, and that is equal to the whole integral. That is the whole quantity, and the whole integral equals 2 pi i times the sum of the residues of f um, at the isolated singularities that lie inside this closed loop. So again, in the red box, I've drawn the, uh, I've written the final statement. So that means the integral we're interested in, the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of p of z over q of z dz. And notice at this point, we could we could even um, we could replace these uh, z's with x's if we really wanted, because from negative infinity to positive infinity, um, p and p and z are real valued, and it's just a real integral. It is equal to two pi i times the sum of the residues of this function, and the function we're interested in is again p over q, p over q z sub k, where these z sub k's are isolated single Singularities in the upper half plane. And why in the upper half plane? Because as r goes to infinity, this semicircle, um, this, this containment right here becomes the entire upper half plane. It essentially gets so big that it becomes the upper half plane. Okay, so uh, now one thing you're probably wondering is there's an i here. So shouldn't this right hand side be in terms of some kind of imaginary number, some kind of i? Yet this left hand side should be a real number. So how can they equate? Well, we're going to do a quick example and see how uh, this magic happens. So here's the example we want to evaluate integral of negative infinity to positive infinity of x squared over 1 plus x squared quantity times 4 plus x squared quantity, dx. Now notice, if you just saw this and you didn't know anything about residue theorem, you might try to apply your techniques of a regular calculus, real value calculus on here, but they're not going to work. There's, there's really nothing much you can do. So um, let's go ahead and use the uh, process. So we're going to say, 
um, we're going to use p of z is equal to z squared. First thing to do is convert all these uh, functions in terms of z so we can use complex analysis. So p of z is z squared. q of z is the denominator. 1 plus z squared quantity plus 4 plus z squared quantity. And I've circled all the exponents for a reason. So let's go back to the proof really briefly and look at what happened. So again, we had this part right here. This is less than or equal to r to the power of negative 2. Uh, so less than or equal to r power of negative 2. And we were allowed to put that negative 2 because we had m is greater than or equal to n plus 2 because the degree of the denominator was at least 2 more than the degree of the numerator. Okay, so now that let us put c over r squared and that let us cancel with that r so that we still had an r on the bottom. What if we couldn't cancel? What if this wasn't r squared? What if the degree of the uh, denominator didn't have that restriction? And what if we just had, uh, for example, c over r instead of c over r squared? If we had uh, m is greater than or equal to n plus 1 or something like that, then we would have this r cancel with this r, and we'd just be left with c pi. And c pi is just a constant. It doesn't really approach, it just approaches c pi as r approaches infinity, and this whole thing breaks down, which is why it's important that the degree of the denominator is at least 2 more than degree of the numerator. So is that true in our example? Well, well, degree of the denominator is 4, degree of numerator is 2, and 4 is at least 2 more than 2, okay? So we're set. Um, next thing, little step I've done is taken the, the uh, derivative of this. We'll need it later on. I've written it right here using our product rule. So now the next thing to do is find where we have isolated singularities. We have isolated singularities where the denominator is equal to 0. Those are poles, correct? So we have poles when q of z is equal to 0. So that's at plus or minus i or plus or minus 2i. Now, we don't need to worry about all four of these because we just need to worry about the ones in the upper half plane. And if we put a little graph, we have a little graph here. i is here, 2i is here, negative i is here, negative 2i is here. The upper half plane only contains i and 2i, so we only have to worry about those two. Okay, so the answer to our problem, the answer to this integral is 2 pi i times the residue at, uh, of p over q at i plus the residue of p over q at 2i. Now, we don't want to leave the answer like this. We want a numerical answer, right? So we need to actually evaluate these residues. And this is where the uh, video on com computation of residues comes in handy. So what's the residue of p over q at i? Well, remember, we learned something about quotients when we have residues. We just take p of i over the derivative of q at i. Remember, we learned that in an example in the last part of the computation of residues video. So if we do this, p of i is negative 1. q prime of i, you just take this q prime, plug in i, you're going to get 3 times 2i, so this is negative 1 over 6i. Same thing with residue of p over q at 2i. You do the computation, you get 1 over 3i. So the answer is 2 pi i times this residue plus this residue. So it's negative 1 over 6i plus 1 over 3i, and you put that in here. And now here's where the magical step happens. Since we have a 2 pi i and we have i's in the denominator, we can cancel all of them out, which means no more i's, and this is real valued from now on. So we have 2 pi times 1 over 6, and we have pi over 3. So the final answer is indeed a real number, just as we wanted, pi over 3, because we had cancellation here. And you'll always have cancellation as long as the uh, initial conditions are met, as long as you have everything in this blue box right here is met, where you have uh, p and q are real valued on real axis and so on. So uh, this is the first type. This is probably the easiest type, and uh, we'll go into a little more complicated types in future videos.